These are turret sleeves. This video is the making of the first turret sleeves. Here's a basic timeline of the turret sleeves project. First, we made the pair of sleeves called the black sleeves. Then we tried to operate them, but we were unsuccessful. Then we made the pair of sleeves called the gray sleeves. Then we successfully operated both the black sleeves and the gray sleeves. We did this at an unofficial shooting range, meaning just a place where people like to bring guns and targets and shoot them, where the ground is paved with empty shells. This is the first turret sleeve prototype I ever made, after I had been dreaming of this invention for a few years. It just has four wooden rods instead of 38 fireworks, but I could wear it on my arm. The next step in the early design was illustrations of the front view and the side view of what I call the Tier 2 turret sleeve. That's the design with 38 fireworks per arm. Then I made a CAD model. Here's a front view parallel projection. And here's a front view with perspective. And some other perspective views. Here you can see the handle inside. And here's all the parts in a disassembled state. At first I thought we would use a fuse branching system that would be a binary tree, and I made a lot of drawings for that, but we never did use that design. Here's a prototype that I made to test binary branching. I tied the fuses together with bent staples. I tried six nodes this way, and half of them failed to branch. Then I tried cutting the fuses open to make them branch better, but then the clumpy gunpowder gets all powdered and falls out the hole, so I had to seal up the nodes with scotch tape, but then that suffocates the fuse burning process. After a few tries, I got similar performance to the staple technique. Here's the six prototypes all burnt up. For our first and unsuccessful trip to the range, we used a fuse system with all 38 fuses converging to a big fuse bundle. These are the fuse extensions. I tied store-bought fuses to the fireworks fuses with five staples for each firework. I had designed this fuse system to work with an oxyacetylene blowtorch, because with a torch like that, you pretty much don't need a fuse system other than the one fuse per firework. But we ended up having a mini blowtorch that you screw onto a small propane bottle, and we went while it was raining, so we only got 12 fuses lit on our first and unsuccessful trip to the range. Here's all the unburnt fuse bits and staples removed. Our successful ignition system is called the Firebox Ignition System. It's basically a box-shaped sculpture made of cubes, like Minecraft. In total, 24 cubes made of 144 plastic squares with 576 holes cut in them, and they're all full of paper towels with several dozen yards of wire tying it all together. When fully assembled, it is rigid and can stand on its edge. This is what it looks like when Gas Man pours gasoline on it. This is what it looks like when it's burning and I have the fuses in it. This is what it looks like after burning for roughly three minutes. You can see the plastic and paper towels are all gone, and just the wire remains. Here's the muzzles of the black sleeves after the unsuccessful attempt. After we successfully operated the gray sleeves, there were a few unburnt fireworks, but Gas Man and Torch Man had fun with those. Here's a set of 76 muzzles all burnt up, and here's another 76 with a few left to burn. We also had burning and exploding targets. Each pot is made of plastic and has paper towels in it and gets gasoline poured on it and a bomb placed inside. Here's how they look after burning for a few minutes. I made each bomb case by gluing together six pieces of plexiglass into a box formation with a hole in the lid. Here they are with the glue still wet. This is ten bomb cases and a camera protector also made of glued plexiglass. Here they are with the glue dry. It was not very fun working with this plexiglass with a hacksaw. As you can see, the plexiglass snaps a lot and snaps right through the other part outlines you've drawn on it. If you took them just like this and put gunpowder inside and stuck a fuse in it and put it in the fire pot, it wouldn't work because the gunpowder needs to be inside a structure with structural strength at the time that the gunpowder is set off in order for the reaction to be explosive. If you put the case like that inside the fire pot, the fire would plasticize the glue within a second, making it lose all structural strength long before the gunpowder is set off and there would be no bang. So I made jackets. Each jacket level has a multi-layer of cardboard, a multi-layer of duct tape, and a multi-layer of aluminum foil, except for the outermost layer which ends in duct tape. This is the second layer with the foil ready to be applied. Here's the bomb box with the bomb cases and the bomb jackets. The purpose of the jacket is to protect the sides and bottom of the bomb case from the gasoline fire which surrounds it. The gasoline fire may burn through some layers, but if enough layers remain by the time the fuse sets off the gunpowder, there will be a container with structural strength around the gunpowder when it is set off, which will result in an explosion. Here's a picture showing the four levels of jackets. And here's a bomb case next to the full jacket. These are the bear scares that I took apart to get the gunpowder. I used five bear scares to make ten bombs, a ratio of one to two. A bear scare is basically an intermediate between a bottle rocket and a rocket-propelled grenade. Basically, a rocket with a bomb on the end. You set off the rocket, and the rocket sets off the bomb. Here it is next to a few bullet shells. It seems to have roughly half as much powder as a 357 round. 
Normally, you load this end with a blasting cap into a launcher the size of a small pistol, and that's the solid rocket fuel you're looking at. Or if you don't have a launcher, you poke a hole in this end and stick a fuse in. Either way, it's designed to scare away a bear if a bear is attacking you. This is one of the bomb cases with its load of the gunpowder. And it's always great when you get to that part of a project when you're done working directly with the gunpowder and you still haven't exploded any of your arms off. It's always a big relief. Here's the jacket levels fitting together. Here's some of the explosions that we caught on film when operating the turret sleeves. Here you see a flash from one of the bombs going off, then three frames that look normal, then another flash from another bomb going off. So these two explosions happened about a seventh of a second apart. With this explosion, the cap of the bomb flies up 30 feet into the air, and the cap also spins up a smoke ring vortex which gets pulled along for the ride. An explosion fit for a pyrotechnical craftsman. Here's another one of the explosions caught from a different camera angle. The flash also lasts for one frame on this one. This explosion was caught as a pair of rolling shutter glitches. On one frame, the bottom two-thirds of the frame are illuminated from the flash of the gunpowder explosion, and on the next frame, the top one quarter is illuminated. Based on this evidence, I can say the flash lasts for just less than a thirtieth of a second, and the brightness of the flash starts and ends with abruptness on the order of one millisecond. It turns out there's actually a chain reaction of six things that burn sequentially in a chain reaction of combustion. The lighter, the torch, the firebox, the fireworks, the pots, and the bombs. I wanted to get more technical and find out how many substances are actually burning sequentially in this chain reaction. The lighter actually has two things burning in sequence, the flint and the butane. The torch has multiple things burning in combination, but counts as one thing in the sequence of the chain reaction. The firebox also has multiple things burning in combination, and counts as one thing in the sequence of the chain reaction. The fireworks counts as two things in the chain reaction, because the fuse is lit by the firebox, then the fuse lights the fireball, then the fireball continues the chain reaction. The pots have multiple things burning in combination, and count as one thing in the sequence of the chain reaction. The bombs count as two things in the chain reaction, because the fuse is lit by the burning pot, then the fuse sets off the gunpowder. So there's a chain reaction from the lighter flint to the gunpowder in the bomb, with seven things, or combinations of things, which burn in sequence between the flint and the gunpowder. And I think that's pretty interesting. Here's the torches I made and the lighter fluid that I put on them. We ended up using gasoline instead of lighter fluid because gasoline burns better. I made each torch by wrapping a sock around a wooden rod and tying it on with 20 gauge wire. Here you can see the sock end, and here you can see the wire ties. Here you can see how the bomb and the bomb jacket fits into the pot. These are the cloth strips that we used to spread the fires between the pots. We had 10 pots and we joined them into pairs, resulting in 5 targets with 2 pots per target. And we used wires at the ends of the cloth strips to tie them to the pots. Here's two pots with the bombs inside and a cloth strip joining them. Of course, we had them farther apart when we put them on the actual range. Here's all the parts that make a pair of turret sleeves, aside from the wooden handles and the fireworks. Most of the parts of the turret sleeves are made of two layers of this panel material in thickness, so here they are all taped up double thick. Here's just one arm, and here's the parts all stacked up, and here's a stack for each arm, and here's a stack for one arm. The assembly process starts with the inner walls and the handle. These big panels use slotted connections. Here's the median walls. Outward facing slots on the assembled parts join with inward facing slots on the incoming parts. Now the inner and median walls are assembled. Now the back plate comes on and these rib parts make their sub-assembly, and they go on behind the back plate. And then the radial walls go in. I didn't show the spacers going in, my mistake for not photographing them. Now the outer walls go on. And that's all the plastic and wooden parts assembled. Here's how it looks actually being assembled with glue, and here it is being loaded up with fireworks. Here's one assembled, with the parts for a second one, and the fireworks. I chose this war paint for the tubes because it's a simple pattern with a forward-pointing aspect to it and roughly half space filling, and it's a cylindrical array of a pattern on a rectangular array of cylinders. As for the face design on the gray sleeves, I made this arrangement of four strokes because it also has a forward-pointing aspect to it and also roughly half space filling, and then I realized that it's just the Chinese character for fire, but modified a bit. It's also the Japanese Chinese character for fire. Then I looked it up, and it's actually the Chinese character for fire in the script style called Xiao Zhuan, which is a stylish font used on engravings and other art. It also kind of looks like a person standing and holding some kind of enormous sleeves or something. Now, any good science invention gets a lot of extra science points if the whole thing is covered in foil, but this facade of duct tape and war paint is just as good, and we have some other things with foil, so we're good that way. And here's that nice alignment of the final assembly. For face protection, I wore a ninja mask and snowboarding goggles. Here's how it looks with a helmet camera, and here's how it looks with a suit. This is the clothes and a few other things that I brought. Pants, shirt, belt, ninja mask, tie, businessman jacket, helmet, helm camera, goggles, gloves, socks, and shoes. 
This is the camera protector which I made from plexiglass and glue. Basically, it's a GoPro shield shield. You put the GoPro inside the shield, then you put the shield inside the shield shield. So the shield shield can get damaged and you can throw it out and the GoPro and its fancy expensive shield remain unharmed. It's like, I heard you like shielding GoPros, so I made a shield for your GoPro shield that can shield the shield that's shielding your GoPro. Here's all the fireworks for two arms, with a TI-83 for scale. That's 76 fireworks. Each one is a 20 ball Roman candle. Here's my arm next to 38 fireworks, which is the amount for one arm. Here's everything after the black sleeves were made, but the grey sleeves weren't done. This is almost everything we brought to the second and successful trip to the range. The only things that we brought that aren't pictured in here are people and cameras, gasoline cans and gasoline, some water for those empty water bottles, a fire extinguisher, and I still hadn't split the bombs when I took this picture. Here's a picture of the same stuff, but with a bunch of it in two bags. And the only things left in that big picture that I haven't shown you close-ups of yet, a trowel for burying the edges of the pots, duct tape, bottles which we filled with water for safety, a lighter, a fire extinguisher which I didn't photograph, some poles, and a computer to get the footage off people's cameras on site. You can tell it's a really good computer because it has 23 cat pictures on the top cover. On our second and successful trip to the range, we made sure to go shortly after a long rainfall so all the trees and vegetation weren't flammable, and we had a fire extinguisher. On our first trip to the range, we actually went while it was raining. You might have noticed that we only had one camera angle for the second pair of sleeves. That's because Gas Man had taken the second firebox and laid it flat on the ground, not realizing that he put it on top of the still smoldering remains of the first firebox. Once he got the full amount of gasoline on it, the gasoline started dripping through and it all got lit up unexpectedly. We only had one camera ready because Gas Man was doing his thing a bit out of sequence. With that second pair of sleeves, we put lighter fluid on the fuses and muzzles to help with the ignition, and it was very effective. What's the most naturally human thing to do after successfully building and operating a rocket? Making a bigger rocket, of course. This is the Tier 3 turret sleeve, with 80 fireworks per arm. Here we see the Tier 2, which was designed to fit my arm, and the Tier 3, which was designed to fit my friend Jacob's arm. If we get a full ignition on a pair of Tier 3 sleeves, it will be 2.7 times the power of our nearly full ignition of the grey sleeves or the black sleeves. And here you can see a Tier 2 sleeve, which is 7 units wide, compared with an illustration of a Tier 3, which is 10 units wide. We haven't made one yet at the time of the making of this video. Well, I hope you enjoyed learning more about the first turret sleeves. Like, favor, subscribe, comment, share, follow, email, links in the description, also watch my other videos. Also buy the original drawings and the old prototype, eBay auction links in the description. I'll buy one of the first four turret sleeves ever made, burnt out of course, but it's still a good decoration piece. Buy a turret sleeves making kit, buy an autograph or an autographed hand drawn logo and receive an official certificate of membership to the Junichiro Support Network. Buy a bunch of them and share them with your friends, seriously, give me money, I'm the inventor of turret sleeves, you know I'll put it to good use.